Howdy folks, Craig Lovati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bones Zoomcast. Today's episode is really cool. We're talking to Dr. Scott Solomon from Rice University. He is a bioscience professor and he has a new show out on the Curiosity Stream app all about becoming a Martian. It's really cool. It's going to be really hard to become a Martian. Hey, are you going to wake up or what are you doing? Hey folks, Craig Lovati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This is, of course, the Beyond Bones Zoomcast. I am not joined by my co-host Cat Havens today because Cat had a prior commitment, some sort of sciencey thing at the museum. But instead, we decided to put the camera on producer Johnny Hamburger there with a red light on his face, like he's in so it sort of some uh, submarine or something. Well, I figured we'd be talking about the red planet. So there we go. Little, okay. My, my, my producer brain is thinking, let's have a little tinge of red somewhere. <laughs> you got the seats behind you, Craig, and there's red this in the office. Just, yeah. I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, yes, watch my podcast for the museum. I host it from my kitchen. Yeah. So with the, hopefully with the Astro seats, Astrodome seats in the back. There we go. Awesome. Yep. Uh, it's archaeology. Yes, uh, it's archaeology and it's also chemistry because there's, well, that sounds horrible. That's just my kitchen. That's, I don't do any <laughs> chemistry in there unless you want to. Macaroni and cheese is chemistry. Uh, today's good. episode, speaking of the red planet, today's episode is, of course, about Mars because you got the red light on Johnny there. And uh, our guest today is uh, one of my favorite smart dudes in town. It's Dr. Scott Solomon. He is the associate teaching professor of biosciences at Rice University, just across the street from the museum. I, if I could throw a football, I could possibly touch part of the museum, part of the, the university, but I can't. Dr. Scott, how are you doing? I'm great. And I think on Mars's gravity, you'd be able to easily throw a football that distance. I would Uncle be Rico. Baker Mayfield. I would be Baker Mayfield on Mars. Yeah. Or at least punt one. Yeah. Remember, we go. remember Uncle Rico from uh, Napoleon Dynamite? He could throw it over those mountains if he, he was could. on Mars, probably. He could. If only they gave him a chance. So Isn't it like one six a- gravity? It is uh, three eighths of Earth's gravity. Ooh. Mars. So I can maybe when I'm like 90 years old and I live on Mars, I can at least like maybe be a towel boy for the first Martian <laughs> NFL team, the expansion team. Uh, today's episode is really cool because we're talking about uh, Dr. Scott Solomon's uh, new show. You want to call it a show? Or it's a series, I guess. It's both. It's a series, three part series. Yeah. Okay, it's a three-part series on uh, the app Curiosity Stream, which if you know anything about Curiosity Stream, guys, it is a really smart, really engaging version of something like a Netflix. And it's just full of great documentaries that are full of real science. There's no pseudoscience. You're not going to see anything about werewolves and monsters and stuff like that. It's really cool. And Becoming Martian is all about the, well, you know, Dr. Scott Solomon here. I'm not going to use your whole name the entire time. You can call me Uh, Scott. (laughs) Dr. Scott, uh, you've always touched on, you know, the basics of human evolution, animal evolution, and, you know, how the the crux of this, uh, this, this series is how our bodies will change when we go to Mars. And that's just going to be something that's going to have to happen. It's really, really great. Um, You know, basically it looks like we're going to, if we start living on Mars, we're almost going to, to evolve into like a pop doll looking people like with big heads and like squattier arms. And just because of the nature of living on another planet that we're not used to, it's just a really great, great uh, three part series. It's really quick. It's really, you'll walk out or you'll, you'll, you'll roll off your couch with a million and, and, and one ideas about uh, living on Mars. I really enjoyed it. And it was filmed partially here in Houston on, at Bryce University. You were outside. You filmed it during COVID, you said. So uh, it gave it a really good engaging. And I, it, the weather looked great. It was. It was December. So it was, you know, <laughs> like lovely for, for yeah. Houston. Yeah. For filming outside. So, uh, Dr. Scott, just tell us about this 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 series. Uh, I'd love to see more. I can't wait. I hope you film more. I hope you're filming more soon. Um, I really dug it and uh, made me really scared and terrified of going to Mars. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the things we wanted to get across is the reality of what Mars is like and how challenging that's going to be if we're really serious about wanting to have people actually live there. And so we wanted to really dig into what are those challenges? What are the conditions on Mars in terms of you know, gravity. We said it's three eighths of Earth's gravity. What does that mean in terms of how our bodies will react? What about the radiation that hits Mars's surface way more than, than the radiation environment we're used to on Earth? You know, our bodies evolved here on Earth and that's what we're well equipped for. So what happens when we're walking on the surface of Mars or if we want to make this a permanent colony or at least a long term colony? You know, what happens when people start having kids? What does it mean to give birth on Mars or to be a baby or a child growing up on the surface of Mars? So we wanted to really explore that and, and figure out what can science tell us about how we're you know, likely to uh, be able to overcome those challenges and what it might mean for, for future generations. No, the, the thing uh, that there was a really cool moment in there where I believe it was during one of the earliest flights, the earliest satellite flyovers of Mars, and how we obviously we found out that there weren't you know, there weren't Martians on Mars. There weren't you know these valleys and creeks and rivers and everything. And we saw everything, and it looked so desolate. But there was a moment where we went, okay, but we still want to go. Mm -hmm. That was the coolest part. I don't know if that stood out to you or not, but when we were like. But we still want to go like it. We even though we saw that there was not a lot there, but we were still just enchanted by Mars, it seems like because, you know, it's it's one of our you know closest neighbors and it still it still excites us like we're not scared of going there. We're still, you know, on a, you know, a runaway train to Mars. Why do you think that is? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you touched on some some key things there. We really wanted to capture here, not just the possibilities for our future, but how we got to the point that we're at now. And so the first episode really looks at a lot of that history of Mars exploration, going back to the first people looking through telescopes and being able to see the surface of Mars and seeing things that they maybe weren't there, but they were interpreting and thinking that, oh, this is evidence that there's civilization already on Mars. And so I think part of what's, you know, really um, captivating about Mars is that we for many years just haven't known what's there. And it's just it's just, you know, uh, captured the imagination of generations of people. And so even now, when we know so much more about the, the, the surface of Mars and the conditions on Mars, I think something about it still is, you know, captures our imagination, the possibility that there could be life on Mars, the possibility that people could be able to live on Mars and imagining what that might be like. I think, you know, partially it's because there's been a lot of great science fiction that has uh, explored the, those possibilities. And, um, and sometimes science fiction inspires real science. And that's certainly been the case for, for Mars. So something about that really has captured, I think, the the the, gener the the imagination of generations of people and and continues to do so today because it's not a real it's not a real romantic place either you know it's sort of uh you know it's big and red and kind of scary it's not like the moon i think where the moon you know the moon has a romance to it and mars represents a challenge and it represents this extra hurdle that mankind has to sort of overcome and to your point, you know, when we get there, there's so many other you you talked about this on the during the series. There's so many things we have to worry about, you know, our diet, uh, there's the physicality of it. There's how are we gonna live there? And I really love the the little segment on there about the 3D printing on Mars and using the uh, oh, describe it for me. You're better at that. It's your the, show. The Martian regolith. So yeah, yes. so we, we, we look at like, how are we going to build homes? You know, what is a, a Martian city going to look like? And this is something where, again, science fiction writers have imagined all different sorts of, of, you know, structures on, on Mars and other planets, but this has started to become, you know, reality with uh, NASA, for example, having this competition a few years ago uh, for companies that could uh, create a it look like using 3D printing technology. 
so we feature in the series, uh, one of the, the winners of that competition that we're able to use a material that is similar to the, what we call the, the Martian regolith, which is essentially like Mars dirt. Uh, and they actually created using a 3d printer, a prototype of a, a Martian of a structure that could be a, a Martian home. And, um, and so you, you can see that in the series, you can see it being made and you actually hear from some of the, the people that were involved in, um, in designing and creating it. And, um, and it's just amazing to, to see what they were able to do using this technology and sort of some of the, the thought process that went into, well, what do you need to have in, uh, in a, you know, a Martian home and what would it look like? And you'll see the, you know, the, the, the architectural plans for what the inside is going to be like, I, I can tell you my daughter, when she saw that, she's like, I want to live there. <laughs> <laughs> now look, cause it looks like a human beehive of sorts. It's like this, like, right. you know, it's tall and it, but it looks, it's like a beehive in the way they built it. And then I liked at the end where they had the caterpillar, uh, trying to, to, to crush it and it didn't crush. And every, that's, I guess that's how they probably like won the award to do it. Cause it's like, okay, cool. At least if it gets, it can't get knocked over too easily. It's going to be, it's going to withstand the elements as, as far as we know now. So that was really, but I also came away from watching those three episodes sort of like, okay, this is going to be a challenge. This is going to be really hard. We're really going to have to get serious about this. This is not something we're going to, uh, well, this is a, this is a museum podcast. We can't do this halfway. Well, you'll right. remember, Craig, I was going to bring this up earlier that, and you'll love this, that uh, JFK, when he gave his speech about the moon at Rice, said we choose to do these things because they are not because they're easy, but because they are hard. So that is exactly yeah. why we're going to Mars. And one of the most interesting uh, concepts that I gathered from the videos, I don't think a lot of people think about this, and I'll ask for y'all's opinion on it too. Um, all the materials we need, like the 3D printers, for instance, just to be vague about it, we need to get them to Mars. And it's not just like, hey, let's send a bunch of astronauts there with shovels and like axes to try to make stuff and, and create things like in a video game. It's we're going to need to be constantly sending supplies and rendezvous yeah. and be setting up maybe satellites and, and space stations around Mars to facilitate these types of things, possibly even around the moon as a rendezvous point. Um, but doctor, I was hoping you could speak to kind of that kind of convoy of materials going to Mars to help us potentially colonize it. You're absolutely right. So one of the greatest challenges when we talk about actually creating a civilization on Mars, like not just sending a few explorers who are going to go and then come back, you know, a little while later, but actually trying to create a place that people can live their lives is, is getting, you know, materials there. It's incredibly expensive to transport materials from, from earth to Mars. It's obviously very time consuming. It takes around nine months uh, to go uh, just from earth to Mars. And that's um, only possible during a period of time that happens about every two years when Earth and Mars are closest to each other in their respective orbits. And so, you know, we won't be able to just constantly send people or materials back and forth between Earth and Mars. Even once such a settlement is well established, it'll only be about every two years, and it will continue to be challenging to move materials and people back and forth. So what that means is that we would have to be able to do a lot of things on Mars using uh, the, the materials and resources that are already there. And that's one of the real challenges is figuring out, you know, how, how can we do that? So we might need to bring the 3D printers, but the material that we're going to print with is going to have to come from Mars. <clears throat> and, you know, likewise with, with food. So we spend a lot of time in the, in the series talking about, well, how can we grow food on Mars? What types of things might it be possible to, uh, to eat? based on what we can grow or, or uh, produce there and what would just not be possible and how will that affect yeah. culture? How will that affect us? Food is you such an important time. part of our lives, right? You mm -hmm. had a good time eating the crickets. I could tell in the episode, well, you know, any <laughs> excuse to, to eat some bugs for me is, 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 is a good, a good time. But yeah, we do talk about how animal protein is going to have to be different. So if we're going to get any animal protein in our diets, 
it's almost certain that we won't be able to bring, you know, large livestock. I mean, nobody's going to squeeze a cow into a rocket, right. Anytime soon. So, uh, we're not going to be taking, um, you know, cattle or pigs or even probably chickens, you know, with us. Um, so we need to be thinking about animals that we can eat that don't take up a lot of space, aren't very heavy and don't compete with us for water and, and food. You know, I mean, right. it takes a lot of, of grain to feed a cow, uh, to produce milk or, or for meat. And so, um, insects become a very logical choice for animal protein because they don't take up space. They don't take up much space. They don't require a lot of uh, water or, or food to, to grow. Um, and there's a side benefit, which is that we often get diseases um, from animals. So, you know, obviously with, with COVID happening, we're, we're interested in finding out for sure where, you know, COVID started. And, and we think it probably started with an animal, but uh, many other diseases we know came from animals. And oftentimes it's from domestic animals, not just wild animals like bats. So we actually could have another sort of side benefit if we bring insects and we don't have birds and mammals with us. Those are the source of so many of our infectious diseases. So people living on Mars might benefit from not having to worry so much about new emerging infectious diseases coming from animals. And on the flip side of the digestion process, sorry, Craig, if you have a question. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The flip side of the digestion process, so to speak, is nothing will go to waste when you're trying to build from scratch. So I've heard, and it sounds kind of gross, that astronauts would actually use a number two, like inside panels of spacecraft to block radiation. So it's conceivable that when you're building these dwellings on Mars, that part of that 3D printing <laughs> slurry is uh, could be yeah. caca. I, I think you're right that we don't want to use anything. We don't want to waste anything. And, yeah. you know, if you read or watched the Martian, um, you know, we all, we all remember what Matt Damon was using to recycle his, uh, his waste, right. It was fertilizer. And so, I mean, that's, that's another thing as you think about producing food is uh, you know, the, the Martian regolith, we call it dirt and not soil because soil has living, you know, microorganisms and nutrients and things in it. Um, the Martian, uh, regolith is basically crushed rock. Um, you don't have that. So we have to supplement. We actually did a little experiment for this, uh, for this series where we wanted to kind of see how plants could grow in the Martian regolith compared to how it would grow here on earth. And, um, so we were actually able to get some simulated Martian regolith, um, from a company called the Martian garden, which you can go online and, and order this from them. And, uh, it's a fun experiment to try at home. I involved my kids in doing this. We had this running in our kitchen, um, up to the, the time when we filmed. Um, so you get this simulated Martian regolith, which is basically crushed rock from the Mojave desert. Um, but it's physically and chemically very similar to the actual, um, uh, Martian surface. And then we uh, planted some wheatgrass seeds in that Martian regolith. And then we planted wheatgrass seeds in regular, you know, like potting soil and, and treated them the same. They were sitting in the same window, used the same amount of water for each of them and then tracked the growth. And it was really cool because you could very clearly see the advantage of growing in the you know, potting soil where there is nutrients, there are, you know, bacteria and fungi in there that, that help the, the plants to grow. Um, so the good news was that the, the wheatgrass seeds did grow in the Martian regolith, but without supplementing it with fertilizer from whatever source you have your fertilizer, uh, they were definitely not able to grow as well. Um, so it just underscores the importance of recycling, uh, everything and, and, and finding a way to, to fertilize plants on Mars. That in the what sunlight was, is less on Mars also. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't uh, <laughs> go quite as far as trying to get the exact, you know, Martian sunlight conditions, but some of those experiments have been done using artificial lights that are more like the uh, reduced sunlight on the surface of Mars. I think Dr. Sumner's did. Yeah. Last yeah. summer, uh, Dr. Carolyn Sumner's over here. She and her, I guess her summer school kids, this was summer of 2020, I think. Yeah. And they did a thing where they were growing peppers and things in the Martian soil and also in regular soil. And they had a good time. I think they even at the end of the summer, they had like a little cookout 
on one of the roofs over there, like up top, you know, and it was, I didn't go up there cause I didn't know what they were making. I was kind of like, okay, <laughs> but it looked like they did a good job and, and they, I, the underlying thing I'll say here too, is that if we're going to go to Mars, we're going to have to, there's a lot of human creature comforts that we're going to have to forego that are not going to, but that probably goes back to people evolving and our tastes and our, uh, what we like and don't like evolving. And you've always taught me and, and I, I credit you with this, even though, you know, I should have already known by then, but I did an interview with you one time and you explained to me, you know, well, evolution is still going. And, you know, even if it's, you know, somebody that lives in New York taking a flight to London and they meet somebody and, you know, they create a family and they go on and they go on, that's still evolution. And that's, that's a, that's kind of a concept that I'm glad you were able to explain on there. But a lot of people forget that when we're there, our bodies will have to adapt to Mars in some form or fashion. That is a concept I think that gets lost in the shuffle here in terms of, okay, we got to grow food there. We get that. We have to bring all of our supplies there. That also means that we're going to have a big industry here on earth of people just making things for Mars. Right. So, but the evolution aspect of it just blows my mind. And I'm glad that you touched on that. Yeah. And actually that was really the starting point for this series. So the, the, um, the director and, and filmmaker that, um, that, that, you know, created this series and we worked on it together, but he's, you know, he's the, the, the head guy, his name is, uh, Mike Mavretic. And, um, he reached out to me several years ago about this because, um, he knew that it was something that I was really interested in and had been researching and, and writing about is this question of, well, if, if we overcome all these obstacles that we've been talking about, and we could actually have a group of people living on Mars that, have families and raise kids and their kids go on to have their own kids. And we're looking at multiple generations in the future, you know, that sets up a scenario where you would ex actually expect following what we know about evolution, that, uh, that those people living on Mars are going to evolve. They're going to evolve in, in ways that, you know, might be somewhat unpredictable, but we could make some, uh, some, some sort of logical, um, predictions based on how we know the, the conditions on Mars affect the human body and how evolution works. And so that was really the starting point for this is, is just thinking through, okay, well, there's less gravity, there's more radiation. What does that mean in terms of how those factors affect organisms uh, on earth or how they've affected humans in the past? So, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm an evolutionary biologist. So that has always been the thing that, um, that has fascinated me about the prospect of moving out beyond earth and into the solar system uh, and beyond. So, yeah, I mean, you know, some of it is, is we have to, to be clear that this is speculation. We can't know for sure exactly what will happen in future generations. But, um, but, but I do think that there are some things that we can say are, uh, you know, logical conclusions about what we would expect to, uh, to happen to people in those conditions. So it was that the heads would get bigger. That was one thing I saw that, that sort of stuck out at me. And then I think it was the heart as well. Correct. Yeah. So we talked about a few of the <laughs> things that could happen. So one of the things, so the idea with the heads getting larger um, is that, uh, you know, we talked about some of the, the challenges of, um, of human reproduction uh, on Mars or even, you know, elsewhere in space, um, the process of giving birth is going to be something that we're going to have to figure out how to do that safely. Um, and um, so one of the possibilities is that, you know, we know that being in a low gravity environment causes bones to become more brittle. So when astronauts spend time, for example, on the international space station, they have to be always doing exercises. You see these videos of them like on running on treadmills and doing resistance training, because if they don't, their bones would actually really become very brittle because the, the, um, you know, our body evolved to, uh, be able to function well in a, a, a earth gravity environment and without gravity pushing down on us, it's the equivalent of like being in bed rest for a prolonged period of time. If you just don't move your body, your, your muscles atrophy and your bones will become brittle as well. So 
What that means for people living on Mars is that childbirth could become an even riskier thing. Because if you've got women who uh, have been in a low gravity environment their entire lives, losing bone density, the forces that are imposed on the body during childbirth might become, you know, dangerous. I mean, it could, you could actually see, you know, broken bones um, during childbirth, which obviously, you know, that's a really scary and dangerous yeah. situation. So alternatively, maybe uh, the births on Mars would be entirely by cesarean section. So C-section births are already pretty common uh, here on earth, uh, very common in the U S um, and so, uh, the idea that we explore there is that if all the births became C-section births, that that could actually lift one of the constraints that currently exists on the human body, which is that the baby's got to fit through the birth canal and specifically the baby's head has to fit through the birth canal. And that is one of the reasons why here on earth, our heads aren't going to be getting any bigger than they already are. I mean, during human evolution, our heads did get bigger, but there's a kind of an upper limit on that as long as, uh, as we have natural childbirth. So if we didn't, if we had all cesarean section births, um, that frees up that constraint. And at that point, the head could evolve to become uh, larger. And there's even some evidence that that has already started to happen to a certain extent in um, some places here on earth where C-section births have become extremely common. I was going to say also uh, these concepts. This, <clears throat> when I mentioned before we started the podcast, these things keep me up at night. It's these rabbit trails of, well, what if this, and then if this, this happens, this, this, this. So not just the mother's bones becoming less dense and more brittle and that causing complications in childbirth, but the fetus's bones could experience the same thing. And maybe the child might not be able to survive the trip through the birth canal as well. So yeah, the C-section right. becoming more common. And I wrote this down a few minutes earlier. I would suspect that the humans that evolve on Mars, let's say the first generation Martian, the first child children born on Mars, they probably almost definitely couldn't come back to earth because they would, their bones just would not be able to handle the gravity of earth. And so maybe the first Martians born on Mars, that's it. Daddy, I want to go back to visit grandma on earth. <laughs> nope. Yeah, It'd be a really a long, laggy zoom call. I think yep. they made a really, really bad teen romance movie about that, about a kid that was <laughs> born on Mars and he tried to come back to earth. It was a whole thing. And but that's that opens up another box too that your identity as a human that you call yourself a martian i mean or are you like some sort of martian human hybrid do you even call yourself human at that point that's a question i wanted to i was almost going to email you last night scott like at 11 and be like well, do you no but i was like yeah so what happens with that do you, are you really called a Martian or are you a human or you, do we come up with some other, you know, funky phrase for that? Right. So clearly that's the idea that we were exploring with the title of the series becoming yeah. Martian is this notion that eventually people might start to identify as Martian. I, I would say there's, I see sort of two elements of that. One is um, a biological identity. In other words, what species are we? We are all here on earth. We are all the same species. We're all homo sapiens. Um, but we have cultural differences in different uh, countries and in different um, you know, regions, even here in Texas, we like to think of ourselves as being a little different, right? So, you yeah. know, I think that it's very likely that even just in the first generation, those types of cultural uh, differences could start to come about. People will probably take pride in being these explorers and being these pioneers that are living in this amazing and very, you know, extreme environment. And they'll probably start having their own traditions and, you know, maybe unique types of foods and holidays and who knows, right? I mean, that's what people that's, do. Th that's what I was about to say is that, that that's not unlike when uh, people started going across the West here in the United States, when they started, you know, they would start colonizing different parts of the country. They were different than the people that say, if you started in New York, say you started at Plymouth Rock, by the time you get to, you know, San Francisco, California, the gold rush time, those are different people. And they have different values. They have a different way of life. And that will happen definitely on Mars because you're already, you're so divorced, if I can use that phrase, you're so divorced already from home base 
that things will definitely change. It's like it's like leaving home, you know. Uh, you work at Rice, so there's probably there's a lot of kids there that you know they grew up in another country and then they fly to Houston to become a student and little vestiges of their life in another country, another culture start falling away. They don't forget them, but they start falling away and they become this, whatever a Houstonian is, is a whole other subject anyway. <laughs> we could talk about that at length, but you become a different person. Yeah, yeah and, and I, it's, <clears throat> it, yeah, go ahead. I was go just ahead, gonna say Danny. an interesting parallel. I've just been reading this in a Michael Crichton book, um, Dragon Teeth. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Native Americans, uh, particularly the, the Sioux and the Crow, were at one point the same tribe. They were the same people. They were the same colony. But at some point in their history, I think around the time the horse was introduced to North America, they kind of they split and they be, got their own kind of different cultures. They were basic. They were the same. But something happened to where they diverged and they be, had their different customs and whatnot. So. I can see that kind of happening to humans too. We're, we're human beings. We go to Mar Mars and we, you know, the first settlers were born on earth. They had to check off the earth box and their birth certificate. But as we uh, expand on Mars, we're humans, but that, like you just mentioned, the, the cultures will just diverge and it'll be fascinating to, to, to see that. I don't know if, if anybody, if us talking on the zoom cast are going to live long enough to fully see the cultural divide that Marsh Martians, it sounds weird to say that are going to mm -hmm. have between earthlings, but uh, one of our generations, maybe my baby boy, 11 months old, maybe he'll start to notice that kind of divergence, yeah. a new culture, a new Martian culture. So it's very, yeah, hey, those, it, we see those divergences now just in society I mean, by, by the right. moment, almost by the minute <laughs> at, at a certain extent. So I think yeah, it's just the history of our, of our, <clears throat> of our species, right? I mean, this is what we've mm -hmm. always done. I mean, if you go back even farther, to the origin of our species sometime between 200 and 300,000 years ago in Africa. You know, what, what did we do? Well, we, we spread out, we explored, we, we had pioneers that first left Africa and explored the Middle East and Europe and made their way across Asia. And some made it as far as Australia and all the Pacific islands, which were, I mean, those were extreme environments that were hard to reach at that time. And then the few that made it across into, you know, the Americas, and as you said, they they diverged culturally and their identities sort of came uh, to, to be um, different. But we can still go back and see that. Yeah, but we're all people. And I think today what's happened in some ways is really the opposite. We've we you know, globalization has brought us more together and made us realize that, like, wow, well, we have you know, we might eat different things or speak different languages, celebrate different holidays. But we're all people. Right. And so I, I think we'll see. I do think that people living on Mars would culturally uh, become distinct in their own special way, but that they would have this strong affinity to their heritage uh, of, of being, you know, earthlings about being humans from Earth. But then you have to play it forward. So how long does that last? At some yeah. point, do they start to feel like they lose that connection? And it's just a you know, in the same way that I can say, well, we all came from Africa, but many of us might not identify with that heritage. But, you know, maybe people living on Mars will know they'll be taught that they came from Earth, but that just sort of doesn't, you know, ring true to them, especially if they can't come back and visit. So will they be um, called Martian Americans? <laughs> well, it depends right. on if they came from America. I <laughs> yes, I was going to say, like, would there, would there be Martian Americans and then there would be. He brought up food and it's because it's because we're recording this close to lunchtime. But yeah, even then, like their like holiday traditions and, you know, they're probably not going to be having turkey on what we would call Thanksgiving. Even then, that would be a foreign. But it does it does bring back to mind the concept of people going across the oceans and, and landing on an island and becoming their own culture there do you were touching on and you you do a great job in all of your presentations doing that stuff i applaud you for that you definitely can explain that stuff in a better way than i can and it, it is it just it mimics that same concept of going to an island becoming your own thing your own people that's going to be the interesting thing that to Johnny's point, sadly, we're probably not going to see that, but it's fun to talk about on a podcast. 
<laughs> so well, yeah, and it, and it's really interesting to make the the comparisons. One of the things that I've tried to do in my work is to is to to think about the ways in which people coming from one planet and going and settling another might be like people or animals or other organisms going to settle an island, right? So we know how that process plays out because it's happened so many times here on Earth. The classic example being the Galapagos Islands, which of course inspired Darwin to develop his theory of, of evolution. And so we can look at, well, what has happened when an organism settles a new place and, and how long does it take for them to become a new species? And what are the factors that influence the ways in which that they evolve? So that's one of the things that we try to explore in this series and that I've, I've written about elsewhere. I think we can learn a lot from that process. I think that the planets in our solar system are a lot like, you know, the islands in the Galapagos or the Hawaiian islands or, you know, any other cluster of isolated you know, habitats, you know, earlier I, I mentioned, and I'm sorry, my brain just keeps going here. I said, we probably couldn't bring a fully evolved, uh, Martian human back to earth, but we probably could bring back, um, some reproductive material and see if that takes in a, you know, fully established earthling and see what that, that child would probably have to be a C-section Would the embryo and the fetus even survive. Um, but yeah, like we can't, we, maybe we couldn't bring a Martian back to earth. They wouldn't survive the gravity, but maybe we can bring a, a sperm or something like that back and see if it, if it even can take here. Uh, it's all, it's also fascinating. There's, there's a million different branches that you, you can go with yeah. this. And then there's a million branches off those branches that you can go with this, all sorts of things we haven't even thought of or conceived of. And, the, the risk is always or the ethical, the ethical, the ethical, yeah. exactly. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. The ethicals and, and we do all the, the best planning in the world, but you kind of wonder, you know, when we went to the moon, did Neil Armstrong get there and be like, Oh crap, we forgot forks. Like, what are we going <laughs> to like, if we get to Mars, like all the planning, everything we're going to be doing for years and, and decades or whatever. Like, what if they get there after all that travel and all that preparation? Like, Oh, we forgot the, whatever, that we need to we'll just we, have we forgot to the adapt. power supply for the 3d we'll, printer or something like we'll that we'll have to adapt that's the thing yeah. and that's one thing that that uh scott you've always touched on is that we always find a way to adapt and things fall away and we and we take in other things and we become something else and that's just the magic of who we are and that's why you are so good at what you do dr scott solomon thank you for hanging out with us i know you're a busy guy you got people to teach and things to do and concepts to, to push forward. Uh, you are a uh, professor at Rice right next door to HMNS. Uh, we love to be so close to you. And uh, I'm constantly excited about everything you're doing. So keep it up and uh, just, I'm glad to know you. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Well, likewise, it's always yeah, fun to yeah, talk yeah, with you. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, Johnny, thank you for filling in for Kat. Got it. Uh, she missed a really fun show and uh, we'll just, we'll bring Scott back eventually just mm -hmm. to, you know, to catch up again. Cause I could already, it was funny while we were talking, I could already see some things that cat was like, that was a point where cat would jump in at something cat jumping in. Yeah. Klein Mech and she yeah. would come in there and she would love that. Some of that stuff too. So uh, yeah, definitely check out becoming Martian on the curiosity stream app. And uh, Scott's in there pretty much the whole way through. I watched it last night and I could hear him when I was in the kitchen. It was really nice and soothing. So there you go. All right, guys, check out becoming Martian on curiosity stream. And uh, Scott, how can we find you on Twitter? I met Scott E. Solomon. Scott Esau. That's easy enough, guys. Go find him. Go follow him. Retweet him. Talk to him. He loves it when people engage him in conversation. Bye, guys. Bye.